Our next speaker is Erica Farr. And Erica is the head of digital archives in the Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library, otherwise known as Marvel, at, M at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. She leads the Board Digital Archives program and assists with digitization projects and supports other digital initiatives involving Marvel materials. She received her Master's of Library Science from the University of North Texas at Denton and her PhD in English Literature from Emory University. Her current research in interests include human information behavior in archival settings and digital humanities research and methodology. Thank you, Alex, and thanks to everyone who's here as well as um, online. So because everything I'm going to describe from this point forward is incredibly particular to our setting in visual archives at Marvel, I wanted to provide, much like Sam did, a little institutional context to just give you a sense of the environment in which we're working at Emory. And so, as Alex explained, I lead the digital archive unit, and that includes me as well as two other full-time professionals in that unit. Um, we are one of five units at Marvel, our rare books, um, research services, university archives, and the ranking of the scripture. And then Marvel exists within this newly merged and to be honest, quite massive new division that is <coughs> between the Emory University Libraries and the University Technology Services. And that's called, let me get that going right, that's called um, Library and Information Technology Services, or WITS. And so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this institutional setting for us offers a, a range of really key partnerships and services that our, our programs completely depend on, including software engineering, uh, technical project management, IP rights consultation, systems administration, and, and such things. So I just wanted to sort of lay this out, that we're one unit within the sort of multi-layered environment of other supporting services. And all of these services really undergird both the workflow and the practices I'm going to describe um, for the rest of the talk. So here's what I'm going to just touch on today. I always like to try to give you a little map of what is to come. I am going to describe as briefly as I can. I think there's going to be a lot of like nice echo and sort of reinforcing um, information from Sam's description of his workflow. Um, I'm going to describe our ideal workflow, and that is in tal italicized for emphasis, because one of the sort of messages of my talk today is that ideal and actual don't always perfectly line up. Um, so as a way of illustrating how they don't always perfectly line up, I'll then sort of give you a brief sampling. There are many to choose from. I chose a few highlights of, of deviations from that ideal workflow. And then finally, I'm just going to sort of touch on a few things that Alex specifically asked for us to sort of talk about, which are some of the impacts that my program has had at my institution, some of the sort of ongoing challenges that we face as a program, and then some of our approaches to addressing sustainability in our program. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> so with that, with that sort of uh, context and background, um, I'm going to just sort of walk through um, the, the, the five key stages of work. And so I thought it was interesting. Sam had four, and I have five. Um, I have. Uh, we have my colleague Dorothy Wall has just over the last year meticulously documented our workflow in our digital archives manual, and it's been really um, sort of illuminating and informative just to sort of see all of our procedures and practices mapped out in one complete document. And so one of the ways we were able to sort of understand our work through that codification process was to sort of map out these key high levels of workflow that are going to be familiar to you probably from your own readings and work but also echoing a lot of what Sam was talking about. Now we do have pre-acquisition broken out as a key, as a separate piece of workflow because it is so important. Um, then we move on to the data transfer piece, which is when we actually take acquisition. Um, triage and archival storage is our third. Processing, fourth, and then <clears throat> or that, that, that very good key of a motivating last element of researcher access. So this, um, this workflow chart documents that workflow that I just described. And I tried, you can't really see the, 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 the uh, contrast in here is so great, but I tried to color code those stages and anyway, data transfer, this one kind of scoops down, this is the appraisal triage and our appraisal storage. Um, 
processing and then access. And so this is sort of gives you a sense and the, the workflow actually goes in kind of like this with some kind of jumps and decision. There's some key decision making processes that determine the workflow to follow. But my talk today is going to try to follow in these sort of color coded sections throughout the uh, throughout the workflow. <coughs> So reacquisition, and I call this one out because it is so important, especially with more digital material. However, it is also, at least at Marvel, unbelievably unpredictable. So its importance seems directly correlated to its unpredictability, unfortunately, <laughs> which can be a challenge. Um, but this is a stage of work where we begin to sort of understand what's to come. And we do this through a few tactics. We um, have a pre-acquisition survey that we um, basically created a more concise and sort of more of a one-pager version from some of the output from the Ames project that Sam mentioned earlier. I think Stanford, I think, has one out there that you can look at as an example. I think there's a couple more wrapped up in some of the Ames documentation. Um, we just wanted to get as a brief as possible. So ours is only about a page, um, and we were hoping that the brevity of it would might encourage our curators to use it more frequently, and we're still working towards that. We also do some sort of general ga information gathering in addition to the survey. I like to know what the hardware is, what the OS is, from the data we're going to be, the operating system is, from the data we're going to be gathering, and then the sort of scope of the acquisition. Is the donor comfortable us with us getting the whole computer, or does the donor only want us to get like one folder, like one file, a full set of a folder set that includes like a set of files? Just very, very focused acquisition. <clears throat> and that we, we typically get this information through the findings from the survey and the deeds of gift for the of sale. So key tools for this phase of work are the survey that I mentioned, the outcomes from that survey, and the deeds that we that we are going to refer to before we actually begin the acquisition process. So um, once we better understand exactly what we require, we begin to make a plan for how we're going to acquire it. And from, from Marvel staff, we have three primary modes of acquisition. One is the data just shows up, comes to us. Two is we actually go to the donor, pack up the hardware and the media, and ship it back to Emory. Three is we go to the donor and in the field acquire the data, leaving the hardware with the donor. So of those three options, two is definitely our preference. Like it makes nothing makes me happier than being able to just go to the donor's house, pack up the equipment, take it back to Emory, and then in our lab space be able to do the work we need to do. The, 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 uh, the second option, um, the third option of going to the, to the donor and actually doing the transfer on site would, is sort of a close second to, for, to, the, to that second option, the, the going and getting it and shipping it back, because then at least you have some control over how the acquisition and transfer is happening. It can be a little dodgy, donors don't always like to see you taking their computer apart, but you, know, you can usually console them and get the work done. Option one, where the data just shows up, is definitely um, last choice, and I'm going to touch later on sort of some of the troubles and complexities that just having the data turn up at your desk, what that introduces into the process. So once we have the data, <clears throat> and we have a, we then create an image, and luckily Sam talked to you a bit about you know, what it means to create an image, how you go about doing that. We typically, at Emory, we try to focus on three image formats. We generate, ideally, AFF format, um, if not that, AD1, if we're having to do a logical image. And then for imaging CDs, we create ISOs. And so by and large, we try to have those as kind of the product of our imaging process. <laughs> and like, like Sam, you know, we use the Tableau right blockers. We've also started using the WeTech right, right blockers because Tableau sometimes introduces some problems, especially with BigCurator. I don't know if you've run into that or not. Um, and again, we're using, sometimes using FTK Imager and sometimes using the Imager within BigCurator. We also have a product box that we use for disks that just you cannot. So key tools here, much like Sam identified, are right blockers, um, the imaging software I've identified, and then we have a mobile imaging sort of kit. It's in a backpack, laptop, or the right blockers that we can typically take out with us, and then a lab that has sort of much like the, the setup, the same machine, a computer with different drives, we actually have the Windows, Linux, and Mac, um, so it's sort of a suite of computers with different drives and connectors um, and storage functions. So, so once uh, once we have that archival quality of the, an archival quality copy of the material, 
we then start looking at transfer and all the storage. Um, that process of transfer for us really depends kind of on what's going on in our unit at any, any given time. If we have time, if it's a manageable set of data, we might actually, um, after quarantine, we might actually do not only that kind of five disk, disk image level metadata description, we might actually export all the files off of the disk image and at least do a first pass, kind of like that accession um, file, the file level accession report that Sam showed. Um, but if we don't have time to do all that, we'll at least package the disk image with some key metadata that comes out of those imaging processes, bag it up in the library of Congress, use the library of Congress tagger, and get it into archival storage. Now, it seems strange to be really excited about ingest into archival storage, but we are really excited about our new workflow that allows us to ingest disk images into archival storage. We've been working for about two years with our software engineering and system administration units at Emory to develop uh, sort of custom set of code and custom set of interfaces that allow us to ingest our logical and forensic disk images into our Fedora instance. And that allows us to do really effective data management. Allow, it's a, it assures us of digital preservation quality storage. And it gives us some real peace of mind about, the, about that content. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the disk, because it's, it's repository driven, the disk images have you know, this, a tightly associated mod in terms of that data. So, Deeply um, relief, big relief to have that in place and really exciting for us to finally get, get that functioning. And one of the sort of quirks was trying to get those really big disk images in. We have some disk images that are over 100 gig, and we just now have that kind of protocol in place now that even those massive disk images can be adjusted. So key tools here are that the Fedora repository I just mentioned and that custom development that enables disk image ingest. Um, our Library of Congress bagger tools allow us to sort of bag up all the, the data and its associated metadata into one bag of transfer, and then FTK Imager and some of the series of tools that are in Big Curve. So, <clears throat> as we've been developing, we've been developing the Digital Archives program in for about four years now. And as I've been developing it, I've been very conscious sort of like um, what Sam was saying about embedding the digital archives functionality in other units and sort of in other parts of the university. Sort of the flip side of that, I've been kind of mindful of importing established precedents and established approach to documentation into my digital archives program because there's great precedent out there. There's a lot of shared workflow, shared mission, shared objectives that we can benefit from in existing units. And that's been especially true with our range of description. And so nowhere has that been most true as, with, as in how we're structuring and documenting our processing workflows. Um, and in particular, our arrangement description unit, which is, I mean, they're like the platonic ideal of documentation. They've just done an amazing job of documenting all their workflows and their manual and everything. So in particular, they have a processing plan template, which is you know, not uncommon. And we've taken that template. Um, we've referred to some of the templates that were made available through the Ames project. And we've created a processing plan template for digital archives. That's been a really big help, um, not only because it allows us to document our work and plan it more effectively, but it also allows us to begin to think about our work in a more in most categorical ways, and in a ways that we're hoping will let us better measure them. Because we're really lacking that in our unit. Like we don't really have a good sense of how long it takes us to process five gig of data. You know, or to, to undertake appraisal and triage for you know, a 50 gig hard drive. We just don't have those measures yet. And this, what we're finding is the processing plan, by breaking up and identifying things like tiers of processing and modes of access, are helping us to think about our work in chunks, labeled chunks better that we can begin to measure. <clears throat> so, so this, so we're, so we're here, this processing happened. We, we, get a, we get a copy of the image, um, and then this is the analysis piece I'm talking about here. We're analyzing files, both for sensitive information, which Sam touched on, but we gotta make sure, even if there are no data restrictions, we gotta make sure we're not releasing social security numbers, credit card numbers, other financial information. And um, we also try to get some sense of the content that's, that, that's there within. And we have, we've been trying to use the big curators. So the big, as, as Sam was describing, big curator is itself a toolkit, but in many, in many ways it's kind of, um, Consolidated a lot of existing open source tools, tweaking them, refining them, modifying them, 
so that they work most effectively in an archive setting. And so we're, we have been trying to use things like the bulk extractor that they they have embedded with the Baker bits to try to get a better understanding of what's in this content, um, what we need to restrict, or, or we, do we, back to the question about redaction, we're not redacting, so if, it, if there's something that needs to be redacted, it's all going to be restricted, so we don't have the ability to redact. Um, <clears throat> but the level at which we're doing that analysis depends on how we decided we're going to process it. And we've identified three tiers of processing that entering. So tier one means that there are no restrictions. So all you have to worry about are these privacy concerns, like social security numbers, etc. cetera. Um, you know, we're largely the data involved is homogenous, pretty familiar formats, like nothing noticeably tricky. Sort of famous last words, but noticeably tricky. Um, we're planning to use a pretty standard format for access. We're not imagining we're going to develop a new mode of access to this data. And we're really hoping that we're just going to use tools like the ones in Victor to do the processing work. No real file level, um, individual file level review. Tier two might have some donor restrictions, but you know, they're either really simple or like pretty high in the category that it's kind of easy you know, to peel off that layer of content. Um, still largely homogenous file formats, maybe a little more of a mix, maybe a, little, a few more obsolete formats, but by and large still largely homogenous, a largely familiar. Um, we're not assigning series and sub-series, so again, we're not doing a kind of file level analysis and, and, and review. And then we're again going to use a standard point of access. Now tier three is you know, the tricky one. That's where we have something that we have no control over, right, as a, as not a bad really high or really complicated level of donor restrictions involved in the collection. <coughs> um, we are planning on doing some sort of like more traditional range of description where we're going to assign series and sub-series. The data may be really heterogeneous, may have really really weird, obsolete, just kind of quirky formats. And because we're doing the series and sub-series kind of more complicated arrangement, we're probably looking at a more custom or a more sort of boutique approach to access. So that one sort of hits all the boxes, right, for like high numbers that tier three. So because we're really interested in beginning to measure these processes for these processes in Emory, this year, um, my staff and I, conveniently there's three of us and there's three tiers, so it just coincidentally worked out that way. We're each of us working on a project in one of those tiers and trying to get a sense of what does it really mean to decide that we're gonna do a sign series and sub-series, like for effort, what does it mean? Um, and you know, Obviously, um, that tier three, we're going to have to be really selective about which collections we're going to choose to process at that level, just because even though we don't have like strong benchmarks and measures yet, we know that's a lot of work. And we're only going to be able to sort of apply that amount of effort to it so many collections we get a given year. So um, in addition to having these tiers of processing, we also have different modes of access that we assign. And the criteria that we use determine how we're going to make something accessible depends on sort of a range of criteria, one of which is the extent. So back to that the, the, more the issue I raised earlier about how we actually transfer the data, the extent has to do with, do we just have a file transfer? Do we get a logical image? Do we get a, a forensic, complete forensic disk image? Um, with scope, the question becomes, like, well, did we just get kind of a smattering of three and a half inch floppies? Or did we get six machines that represent almost the complete digital life of a given donor. You know, that's a really big difference in scope, and that's going to have an impact on how we want to make that data accessible once it's fully processed. And the last criteria has to do with the health of the data. You know, do we feel like, you know, is, it, is it seriously compromised by mal malware and viruses? Like, you know, is it a really quirky set of like architectural files that are just kind of a nightmare, and we're not really sure that we're going to be able to make them accessible so those are kind of the three big views that we try to take on the data when we're trying to decide how we plan to make it accessible. And then that decision of how we're going to make it accessible has a big impact on what level of processing, you know, what um, approach we're going to have to range description. If we're going to, we're really interested in original order in, the sense, in that sense of, you know, wow, look at how this author structured his desktop, and it's really interesting the way he, he or she you know, nested applications and files within folders. We kind of want to give the researcher that experience. Well, then you know, we're, we're going to know that we will need to maintain original file formats or what you can do with emulation. It's going to have an impact on how we're actually handling those individual files versus having a bunch of data on the 3.5 inch floppy that we just migrate to a PDF and then make available through network 
for storage is like a flat file directory structure. So it can have a big impact. Tools here are the processing plan, some of those tools that are nested within BitCurator. Um, we do have to use system simulation and processing sometimes when we're working on files in their native environment and in their native format. And of course, we use our, you know, the finding aids that our AD's colleagues um, produce because that helps us shape how we're describing the collection in the more digital setting. So all of that, of course, is to prepare it for access. Um, we have, from the very beginning of our program, been really interested in exploring uh, effective ways to provide access to more digital collections. I think it is the most promising and the most potentially high impact area of our field to really think about how do we serve researcher needs with this fundamentally differently natured primary material. How can we leverage these sort of latent and native advantages of, of digital content for the researcher experience? And so when we acquired the, paper, the personal literary papers of Salman Rushdie back in the mid-2000s, um, we, we really did get a great sort of huge first collection. We got prizes of data from him, from him that, was, that spanned about 10 years of his computing life, starting from some data off of his very first computer, running all the way through to the data that was on the machine he was using when we got the acquired the material. We got, except for the data transfer from the last machine, we got the actual equipment that he had used, so we had complete computing environments. Um, and he was really keen to sort of see what we can do with this digital archive. And so for, for Rushdie, we did sort of two proof of concept approaches to access. One was an emulation. And in case it's not clear, an emulation is when you basically replicate another often earlier and now um, obsolete operating system within a current one. So you're looking at a current you know, Mac desktop with a current Mac OS, and then you're able to actually launch like a mid-90s version of Mac operating software, op um, operating system software inside your current Mac. And so that's, we have an emulation running of, of Rushdie's earliest machine that's available to researchers in our reading room on a secure kiosk. We also created, um, a web app that, that basically is restricted only to the reading room that gives you a little more kind of current. Because um, of course, you know, when you're working with an emulation, you're working with a mid-90s Mac computer. <laughs> and any of you who worked on mid-90s Mac computers know that they had their quirks. And so you know, it can be a little bit alienating, I think. I mean, I think it's fascinating, but it can be a little like, whoa, that doesn't work the way I thought it was gonna work. So we also have this searchable database that runs through a web application. Um, basically runs through Firefox that lets you access and view PDF migrated versions of the files. And then you get that kind of more contemporary, more familiar experience of being able to search and browse, do advanced searching. We did map over the directory structure from the original machine so that people, when people are using the emulation and they're using the search database, they have that kind of connection, that mapping of data that can let them easily go between the two points of access. <laughs> now, as I've mentioned, we've been working really intensely for the last two years on infrastructure development, on getting our just images into our pool, preservation quality, our pool storage, and you know, that by nature has taken our attention away from access. So for the last few years, as we've been processing a few other collections, um, in addition to finishing the Rushdie material, we've had to come up with a short-term solution for access that does not have an impact on our software engineers, our system administrators, when you can only go to the wells and need to <coughs> really wanted to prioritize the archival storage piece. So um, for the collections we're working on now that we've recently processed, we're just providing access to them through network storage. So in the reading room, you can go to a dedicated kiosk in the reading room and get access to just like file, you know, folders with, with, with organized files but alphabetically by file name and just work through. So it's not as complicated, it's not as tool rich an approach to access, but it works for now and we'll have to sort of make do with that until we can get our infrastructure work um, finalized and move on, move on to other, um, other more innovative approaches to access. Um, so I think I was talking about like how we're really interested in, at Emory in how to make the right kinds of tools for more digital material. And just like Sam was talking about wanting to pull in digital humanity tools like uh, data visualization and network mapping and things like that into the processing feature, which I, I think would be awesome. Because I mean, honestly, we feel like 
the tools we need as archivists to process the collection are many of the same tools we think our researchers might like to play around with to get into, view, and analyze the collection. So I think it'd be really interesting to explore. We have kind of a recently formed Emory Center for Digital Scholarship um, that uh, I'm kind of keen to sort of see how we can be able to partner with them about seeing how we can bring some of those new manuscripts into the reading room for researchers. Um, so all of that um, was describing this like very orderly, tidy, sequential workflow um, that almost never happens, just ever. Um, so I'm going to touch quickly on our link on that. So very quickly, I'm going to touch on just a few examples of deviations of what, you know, where, as much as we've documented and thought through all these workflows, it just doesn't work that way. The first is really one of my very favorites, and I, I call it affectionately the plastic sack of data. And so I come in from work one day, come into work one day, sit on my desk, and literally a, gro a plastic grocery sack is an external hard drive, and there's a scrap, not even like a full sheet like just a scrap of paper that has a foundation name scribbled on it and a note that says the foundation wants the drive back. That's all. So of course, no pre-acquisition survey <laughs> with this collection. Um, I literally don't know anything. I hadn't even heard we were acquiring this foundation's papers. It was just a big mystery. I, we are able to identify some accession information, some custodial history, but then that's all we have. So we just have to plow ahead. That's all we're going to get. Um, we, we image it. We begin doing that early appraisal. And as we begin digging into these files, of course we realize that of all collections, this is the collection that desperately needed pre-acquisition survey because it was an organizational record. So multiple users had created and managed these files. They had very different folks, oh, right? They, they, they had very different, um, very, very different there's two partitions on the drive. There's a Windows and Mac partition. There's all kinds of duplication within the partition, between the partitions. Some of the craziest file naming conventions. I mean, you can't even say conventions, and that's not funny. It's like file naming spontaneity or something. Um, the, and literally, there was a file that was comma, 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 dot, dot. That was the file. Um, and so, you know, what do you do with it? It's a, ter it's a terabyte of data. It's, a nightmare. We, we actually haven't processed it yet, but I will say an outcome of this kind of acquisition <laughs> is that the process to image and appraise took way longer than it should have. And if we had, could have had just a little bit of pre-acquisition work, we would have been in a much better position to move forward with the actual uh, appraisal storage and processing. So another option that challenges our workflow and makes us be flexible and accommodating is when um, Again, no pre-acquisition intervention, but when a curator just comes and brings you um, a, a jump drive, you know, a little key drive, and there's no disk imaging, there's no checksum, so there's no way to like, ensure that the data that you have is the data that they got off the computer. Um, and you know, this is problematic for us. Of course, there's no pre-acquisition or interview again, but this is problematic for us because you know, our whole workflow depends upon having a disk image. Right now, we need a disk image to ingest the article storage. So this kind of approach, you know, it, it really challenges the authenticity. How do we know that the files that our curator got from the donor are the ones that we're getting back in, back in Atlanta? We don't have any checksum to ensure data fixity. Um, we also now have really no way to put it in our article storage because it's not a disk image. Um, so you know, not ideal for this option either. And then you know, sort of on the heels of, of Sam talking about imaging, I think imaging is one of those things, like when you read how to do it, and like when we documented it in our manual, it seems so sequential and straightforward. And then when you actually start doing it, especially with old media, it can be like one of the most frustrating processes you've ever had in your entire life. Because you'll, you'll have like with Alice, with Alice Walker papers, we had over 30 external, uh, three and a half inch floppies that all were about within the same five year time range. We ended up spending several months imaging these and ended up having four different imaging setups just to get them all captured. So it becomes this like, really mysterious kind of if-then statement of like, okay, so if you take floppy A and put it in workstation B using imaging software C and write blocker B, then you might get a good image. And you can get it, but it can be, it can really, we sort of begin to think about imaging, especially of this legacy media as being like a really bold headed process if you just have to keep at it. 
and like different drives can like you know, we had to think about eight different three and a half inch floppy drives that we can use. Some of them have a power block or some don't. You just it's almost like a combination game. You just have to keep trying the different floppies in the different drives with the different workstations to find the combination that works. Um, another, I mean, this is both. I, I couldn't decide where to file this in the talk because it's both a real opportunity and a challenge, and that's working with sort of nascent and emerging. Tools. So we've been count ourselves very lucky to have Victor over the last year to be a sort of early tester. It sounds like Sam's been testing more than it too. It's helped refine our workflow. It's definitely sped up some of our processes. And it's going to be a great tool, and we're going to keep using it. But when you're working with a tool this new, they're almost always developing it. They are always developing it. It's still, it's still actively under development. And so you almost have to build into your workflow managing the tool. We're often doing updates, doing updating the complete install, making sure you understand what the changes are in that version and how to make it work back in the workflow. It's just, it's something to know. There's also usually pretty light documentation with these early tools um, and emerging tools. And you, know, you have to be pretty comfortable with fumbling around in a dusty <laughs> room, um, making you figure it out a little bit as you go. But on the same side, we've done a lot of custom development at Emory. You know, there, there are real advantages to doing that. You get to build to your needs. Um, you get to obviously really shape the outcomes and the products that are developed. But it also has a huge institutional and community impact. I mean, not only did we um, hit our software engineers and system administrators pretty hard the last couple of years, but our unit itself was deeply involved in that process. I mean, we worked on the multi functional requirements. Um, speaking to Sam's iterative interest, we do agile development, which is based on development iterations. Um, and so, you know, every two weeks, we're kind of back in a new cycle of testing and, and um, reviewing requirements and user stories. And it's really important, and I value what's come out of it in a really um, significant way. But this is effort that you have to, for which you've got to plan and you have to allocate, because it's going to hit your team pretty hard. And it takes time. So, just a few closing thoughts here. Impact is one of the really interesting questions Alex asked was, you know, how has your program impacted your institution? And I honestly hadn't even thought about it quite that way before, and I thought it was a really good question. And for sure, one big impact has been on the on our software engineers. Um, there's been other work that was done more slowly or that wasn't done at all because we were putting a lot of energy into the digital archives and infrastructure work. And you know that that's an impact that's felt not only by my unit and software engineering, but also the unit slow down. Um, we do have an impact in our reading room just because we're, it's not been big yet, but we are already introducing new formats, new methodologies, and new approaches into public services that that unit, that, that research services team has to manage and deal with. And I think it's going to be really important as we continue to develop new tools and new approaches for accessing more digital material that we work really closely with research services to make sure that what we're planning is feasible, sustainable, and supportable by their um, I wish I could talk more about metrics and assessment. I think it's so important for our field, both for sustainability and for sort of defending and the amount of resources that have to go into the work we do to have a better sense of how long it takes to do the work we have to do. You know, I feel like technical services and processing teams have all these great formulas for like how much they can process per linear foot in a year, how many linear feet they can process in a year. I would really love to see that digital archives at least get somewhere closer to that kind of formula driven planning and prediction of, of output and work. We're definitely not there yet, but that's a key part of what we're working towards for sustainability. Um, and then I want to really second the embedding idea that Sam, that Sam mentioned, because I feel like one of the real advantages we had in our work at Emory has been that we have really been involved in kind of university and libraries-wide IT conversations um, as we were developing this infrastructure. And I think moving, as, as much as possible, moving into enterprise level um, IT infrastructure is really key for sustainability. Because then all of a sudden, the people who manage your networks, manage your storage, manage your code libraries, understand that you have sometimes really huge digital assets that have somewhat particular needs for security, somewhat particular needs for preservation, and you're just automatically going to be a part of those conversations moving forward. 
and by being tied in with enterprise level structures and infrastructure, you're more secure, right? Like they're not just gonna up and cut network storage without some conversation. So, um, and finally, I just feel like you know, the balancing act of managing a digital archives program sort of requires you to at once you know, strive to sort of find some kind of even ground between the need to document and the need to improvise and, and the need to be agile and the need to be you know, predictable and controlled. So lots of balancing and lots of um, tension, but I think it's always been a really productive tension for digital archives. And that,